I have struggled all week with something that happened just after worship last Sunday. Now, some of you may have still been around and may even already be cluing in to what, I was, what I'm talking about, but last Sunday, after worship, a man asked if he could wash his laundry here in the church. This man is homeless and has asked for help on previous occasions. Once the other ministers and I decided to make an exception and to help him, but with the very clear understanding that in the future, when he had such a request, whether it be for a shower or laundry or another need, that he go and connect with one of those ministries right here in our fair city that is designed to meet those needs. I knew even when we entered into that bargain that it would soon be violated so when he showed up again with his request, I wasn't surprised, but I'm sorry to say I wasn't better prepared. My inclination was to say no. We talked about this. No. I struggled because the Bible tells us clearly and explicitly to help those in need. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus talks about when we do things like helping someone with their laundry, we're doing it for him. In Hebrews, we have this enigmatic phrase, don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some have entertained angels without knowing. And if you want to check chapter and verse, that's in 13, verse 2. The entire Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, can be summarized by Exodus 23, verse 9. For you shall not oppress the sojourner, or it could be translated as the foreigner. For you know the heart of the sojourner, for you yourselves were sojourners in the land of Egypt. These, just, these three examples are the tip of the iceberg for biblical support, for helping the other, for, for doing things for other people. And so I struggled with it, with that knowledge going into the exchange. But I continued to struggle as I read this passage and studied Ephesians chapter 2. Because Ephesians 2 is all about being one in Christ Jesus. Not just one with our friends. Not just one with those of you who are easy to love. That's all of you, by the way. It's not just being kind and sharing with those who we, we, really, we know they really deserve it. Becoming one in Christ means reconciling with those with whom I disagree and see the world very differently. It means overcoming differences. It means finding common ground in Christ. And so with a bit of biblical edict to help people, how could I turn someone away? Were, were my afternoon plans so important, so significant, that I couldn't wait with this man who is struggling and I know he is. Could I not wait with him while he did his laundry? I thought about him as I was reading Ephesians 2. See, the wider context of Ephesians 2 and 3 is this theological reflection on salvation in the body of Christ. It's what makes these epistles so much fun because it gets into the nuts and bolts of what it means to be in a relationship with God. Jesus' work on the cross and through his resurrection provide the basis for our relationship with God. And we must accept that God accepts us. God has the freedom to make a choice and chooses to release all of us from the bondage of our sin. Why? Simply because God decides to do so. And so our task, our invitation, is to accept being accepted. The author of Ephesians shifts in chapters 2 and 3 between we, we, and you. For example, in 2.10, 
It says, we are what God made us. But immediately after, in 2.11, it's tone shifts to you. You were Gentiles by birth. That tension of Ephesians and its context sort of is always right there below the surface. There are those who are the insiders, those who were already in the club, those who were already in relationship with Jesus because of his Jewishness, and those who had not really been a part of it. Those Gentiles by birth, which is all of us, as a matter of fact. This passage juxtaposes once you were far with the notion that now you are near. The theology bears down on the mess we, all of humanity, have created. The church is a worldwide institution now today. And yet, in spite of this oneness in Christ, in spite of one baptism in Christ, we have factions that are too numerous to name. We find unity in Christ and then immediately figure out a good reason, absolutely justifiable reason to separate from our fellow believers. But in this context of Ephesians, in that world, there were these divisions. Jewish people and the larger Greco-Roman society experienced tension in general. And then when you add religion to the mix, Time is the same across the ages. In polite company, we don't discuss what? Thank you, choir. Some people are paying attention this morning, and God bless you all. I really appreciate it. In polite company, what don't we talk about? Yeah. And it was the same in first century Palestine. The Jewish people in the wider Greco-Roman world lived in this tension. And so when you bring religion into it, it's almost like they were just getting over the difference. And then here we find in Ephesians, this passage brings it up again. The weight of hearing the distinction without returning to the sense of separation rests on the phrase, you once were. You once were separate, but now we are all united Ephesians 2 begins with this shift from separation to unity. And then in verses 11 through 13, we, we see how we were once without Christ, but now are in Christ. And then 14 to 18 is a hymn. It's basically what it was. I was, I was trying this week to set it to music and was not successful. So, um, sorry, I'm not going to break that out right now, but we can open our Bibles later maybe and try to sing it. Next week, we'll sing it. Verses 19 to 22 summarize this household of God. And the church is the result of God's reconciling work in Jesus Christ. In Ephesians, the perfect church, the church of God, is not full of divisions. This church, the unified church of God, is one that has everyone together, and yet it is probably aspirational. It probably never existed. Otherwise, there wouldn't be this tension right below the surface in Ephesians chapters 2 and 3. But we can work at it. We can aspire to be something more like that church, that unified body of Christ, that body that draws others in, that body that exemplifies overcoming divisions. And it's a little bit like how in our faith journey we can never be fully perfect, but we can continue to grow day by day. We can continue to make that choice to seek God first and to grow in our relationship with Christ Jesus. What is the church to us? What is the church to most people today? To the man last Sunday who waited just outside while we were gathered here worshiping, the church was a place to do his laundry. That's what he saw. What is the church to most people? Do they see it as a building? Do they see it as a club, a place where people gather together or is the church God's mechanism in this world to reconcile humanity to God's self? 
all of the faith divisions lead us to build walls that separate us from one another. Christians isolate themselves from other Christians. Christ breaks down these walls between us. Sometimes these divisions represent something good. Our houses have walls and roofs to keep our furniture dry. And as a friend of mine used to say, we have locks in order to keep honest people honest. And if we are being honest, there are those who might try to take our things from us or may even try to hurt us. And so sometimes these walls seem to be good, but other divisions aren't good. The divisions that separate us from the other, whoever the other is, are bad. These divisions, these are the ones that make us see people differently. When someone lives in a particular neighborhood, when someone has a bumper sticker representing or pointing to some different ideological or political belief, when someone comes from this place or that place, or someone lives in perpetual food instability and is dependent on the benevolence and goodness of others in order to be able to have nourishing food, these divisions are bad. Some churches seem like they should be separate from us. We can look at, at what they believe, what they say they believe, and say, they have bad theology. They say things that misrepresent God, the Bible, and the Christian tradition. And, and so I'm glad that we have the freedom to disassociate with those kinds of people that division gives us space to grow. But before we get too far into that, we've got to be really careful. I'm going to borrow an analogy from Jesus. We've got to be careful about pointing out the speck in another church's eye when we have a plank in our own. Our beliefs can have shortcomings. What bothers me might not bother you what forms a barrier between me and God might not be an issue for you. In Ephesians, we find the message of Jesus Christ right in the middle of these divisions, right in the middle of this tension. And when we experience God's transformation, we can set aside some of these differences and we can come together in Christ Jesus. No longer do we hang our hats on this specific belief or that belief. Instead, we find oneness in Christ, joining other Christians in doing God's work, and we can find unity. And in that moment, we do ministry with, not ministry to. The man who asked about the laundry, here's what he saw. Here's what I think he saw in the church. He saw a place that does ministry to. And so he was going to provide an opportunity for us to do ministry to. He was going to come and be the dutiful recipient, He'd get some clean clothes, and we could feel good. But when we experience transformation in Christ, when we experience unity in Christ, and we shift away from ministry to and into a ministry with, we don't see him as somebody who is just the recipient. I can learn from him. I can grow with him. The basis of his salvation is the exact same as the basis for mine. God has already chosen to accept him in his sinfulness just as God has accepted me in mine. I don't know what any of you are thinking. I don't pretend to be clairvoyant. But I will say this. Doing ministry with carries risk. We have to open ourselves. Sometimes we find ministry with inconvenient. To enter the faith journey means for us, for me, recognizing that we don't know everything. Unity in Christ means putting God first. This is frightening, but even ahead of the self. And the challenge then becomes resituating the conversation. He says, can I wash my laundry in your church? And at that moment, my calling is to love him where he is. That's all of our calling. 
just as God loves all of us where we are. So what do we do? We can invite him in. We can show hospitality. But we can also tell him why we're here on a Sunday. What's the point? Why have we gathered in this room? Why do we sing the songs we sing? And when we tell him what we're doing, we can invite him to sing hymns with us, pray with us, read scripture, share thoughts on the verses we just read. I messed up. I could have handled that exchange better. When he asked if he could do his laundry in our church, I put on my senior minister hat. And that's not a hat I should wear often. I should have put on my follower of Christ hat. I should have, like Paul says in Romans 13, 14, put on Christ Jesus. Paul also says it in Galatians 3, 27, when he says, clothe yourselves in Christ Jesus. But those are the verses I should have been thinking about. Not, oh man, I'm tired. The youth mission trip was awesome. You all are awesome. But they wore me out. <laughs> and by Sunday afternoon, I was, I didn't have any plans. I just wanted to go home and put my feet up. I'm not perfect. Thankfully, I'm in the company of people who aren't either. Every single one of us is in need of God's grace every single day. And every single one of us is on a journey. And each step on that journey, each day, we all have the opportunity to grow. We have the opportunity to make a choice and to choose whether or not to take advantage of this opportunity with Christ, to take advantage of the invitation to put on Christ Jesus, to accept that God accepts us, to put God ahead of the self and to seek unity in Christ. And the challenge is when we go out these doors to remind ourselves that the people we meet, those are the ones who we're invited to be in unity with. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen.